Okay, let's go and get started. Uh, we're running toward the end of the semester here. We've only got a couple weeks left, and I want to give time for you to finish up everything, and uh, also time to study for the final exam. So we really have just a couple weeks left, uh, four classes, uh, including this one. And so what I want to finish up with is we've done a lot of Python concurrency things. I've tried to focus a lot on the, the concepts of what we're doing. Uh, synchronization, the difference between threading uh, and multiprocessing, uh, when do you use each, the concepts of uh, shared memory versus uh, interprocess communication uh, versus uh, asynchronous programming and so forth. Uh, I've tried to spend a lot of time on that. We've used Python, but I do want to give you a little bit of taste of uh, concurrency and how other languages uh, can be made to uh, perform concurrent programming. Now, one thing to keep in mind is all those concepts uh, that we've talked about previously with the, and we've done examples in Python, those also exist for those other languages. Concurrency isn't a Python specific thing. It's really anywhere that you have concurrent operation. Uh, almost every programming languages, language has some support for it, uh, either through libraries or built-in operating systems. If you're using an operating system, there's stuff going on concurrently all the time. So uh, it's an important thing uh, to note. So we're going to focus today on C and C++. So there's several ways to achieve concurrent execution in C uh, in C++. Just like there were in Python, we have multiple threads. Uh, and that's the same as it was in Python, uh, threads sharing the same process memory. Uh, multi-processes uh, or multiple processes uh, completely in their own separate memory segment. Now, those are essentially the same concepts uh, and options as they we saw in Python. There is one difference, though, that if you're programming in C or C++, it's creating code that runs, uh, compiles to native instructions of your computer architecture. So in other words, you're, it's compiling to direct CPU machine code instructions. And that means that it's not running on an interpreter. And because of that, there is no global interpreter lock in C and C++. So that also means that uh, a C or C++ program that's using multiple threads could potentially take advantage of multiple cores, uh, where in Python, since the interpreter was assigned to one core, if you had multiple threads, they were all still sharing one core of the processor. Um, in C and C++, if you make multiple threads, those could be scheduled onto different uh, cores of the processor. A little more, uh, a little easier to take advantage of that uh, processing power. But we also have to be careful uh, to use synchronization and communication where appropriate. Uh, similar to what we did in Python, but uh, it's up to us as the programmers to be careful. Uh, whenever we're using threads or uh, multiple processes. So multiple threads. So the first idea here that we're going to look at is how to spawn multiple threads. And to spawn those, uh, there are a couple of options. One of them is to use what's called pthreads, which is the POSIX threads library. And that was the standard for many, many years. Uh, it's still used a lot. Uh, and POSIX, if you're not familiar with that, POSIX was kind of a standard uh, way that Unix systems uh were set up to uh, be interacted with. And the idea in POSIX was when Unix first started to be widely used uh, after it was released into the public domain, a lot of different companies and uh, groups, universities made their own versions of Unix and they started to kind of diverge a little bit. They started to have uh, operating system level function calls that worked differently on one version versus another and so forth. And so this POSIX group got together and they created a standard way of do, doing things. And so one of the things they standardized was how do you make and manage threads? And so pthreads is that implementation that has, has had become kind of the universal way of doing that. Well, one of the things though is that POSIX threads or pthreads library, that was not part of the language uh, itself. It was not part of the standard language facilities. It was kind of an add-on library that was added onto it. So starting in C++11, uh, now uh, about 10 years ago, uh, they started including this thread uh, 
object for C++, and that was added to the standard language facilities. And that's kind of considered the new way of doing that. And really, they, it kind of accomplishes the same way. One of them uses this library. Uh, one of them uses the thread um, class uh, that is built in the language. So if, you have, if you're targeting an older system or an older language, then pthreads will probably be your option. If you want something that's newer, use thread. But you have to have a compiler that supports C++ 11 and later uh, in order to do that. So let's start with pthreads. Let's start with the kind of the old way of doing it, which still works. So let's dig into that. So prior to C++ 11, there was no uh, support, like I said, directly built into the language. It had to be supported through this pthreads library. And so pthreads library was a standardized way of adding threading to C language and C++. And really, this, uh, the POSIX uh, methodology, pthreads, that is kind of written in C. So it doesn't really use classes or objects and instances. It basically is just a library. And to use that, we just need to include the uh, pthread.h. And you just do pound include pthread.h. And really, that's all we need to include. So once it's included, we just need to use the functions that have their prototypes defined in that header. And in order to use those functions, uh, let's start with creating a thread. So to create a thread, the function prototype looks like this. So you'll notice it's pthread underscore create. And you'll notice almost all of the pthread functions start with pthread underscore and then the name of what it's doing. So pthread underscore create. And then uh, there's a pointer to a thread object. There's this uh, constant pthread attribute uh, pointer that we pass in. And then we pass in a pointer or the address of the start routine or the function that we want to start up. And then we pass uh, this pointer to the argument list uh, that goes to that function. Now this is going to look a little familiar. If you look, think back to how do you create a thread in Python, we had that target equal. That's kind of like what this is. This is a function pointer uh, in C. So the name of a function in Python. And then you had the arguments, args equal, where you pass in the arguments. That's essentially what this is. The only difference here is we have this pthread underscore t, this pthread type here. And then we have this uh, attribute here. So let's look at the description of this. So the description says uh, the pthread create functions used to create a new thread with attributes specified by ATTR. Uh, if ATTR is null, the default attributes are used upon successful completion. pthread create stores the ID of the created thread and the location of the uh, location referenced by thread. So in other words, this is, is how, where the ID of that thread is. And you can think of that as like a handle or uh, each thread will have a unique ID. So even if you start them with the same start routine, you'll get this. So you can think of that as kind of like the ID of the reference to the thread. Now, what about the return value? Well, let's finish off what we had up here. The, the thread uh, is created executing start routine with arg as its sole argument. If the start routine returns, the, uh, the effect is as if it were an implicit call to uh, pthread underscore exit using the return value of start underscore routine as the exit status. So if successful, pthread underscore create function returns zero. Otherwise, it returns an error number. So this int that gets returned should be zero on success. If it's not zero, then we know something went wrong, and the number that it returns tells us what went wrong. So really, we can call this one function, pass it a function pointer, pass it this uh, any arguments that go to that function, it'll create a thread for us. Now, once that thread uh, is created, a couple other functions here that are worth looking at, join, equivalent of join that we saw there, we pass the thread pthread t id. And then there's this void pointer uh, value underscore ptr. Let's look at the description of that. It says the pthread join function suspends execution of the calling thread until the target thread terminates, unless the target thread has already terminated. So in other words, this will block until that uh, until that completes, if, if it's already completed, it won't block, it'll just continue on. It says on return, uh, from a successful pthread join call with a non-null value PT argument, the value passed to pthread underscore exit by the terminating thread is made available to the location a reference by value points. Now this is interesting because this means that uh, threads in that are started with pthreads can actually return a value and notice that this void pointer here, 
it will store, that will become the pointer to the thing that was actually um, the return value of that function. When pthread join your return successfully, the target thread has been terminated. And on return, it says it's successful, the pthread join function returns zero. So again, this returns an integer, not the return value. The return value is put in this value pointer. The return value over here uh, is whether it joined successfully, and we'll get a zero if it does. Otherwise, we'll get an error number. And you'll notice that that's a, a constant across the way these things work. Now to exit a thread, if it if you're the thread that's actually running, pthread underscore exit, we pass in the uh, avoid pointer to the value we want to return. And it, to remind you of your C language, avoid pointer is just an address without a type associated with it. And the reason they made this avoid pointer was that way if you had an integer to return, you could return the address of that integer. If you had a, a string to return, a character pointer, you could return a character type. So rather than giving this a type, they made it void, so it's just an address. So it's up to us when we implement that to make sure that we're uh, interpreting that address correctly according to our application. But it made the pthread underscore exit function uh, and the join function kind of universally applicable. So, in, so notice that pthread exit function terminates the calling thread and makes the value, uh, value underscore pointer available to any successful join with a terminating thread. It says an implicit call to pthread exit is made when a thread other than the thread uh, in which main was first invoked returns from the start routine that was used to create. So in other words, we don't have to do a pthread underscore exit. Uh, an implicit one will happen anyway. And it says the function's return value serves as the thread's uh, exit status. So we, if we don't put that on there, whatever that function returned is what gets uh, placed into this value pointer anyway. But we can use this if we want to. And notice there is no return value on pthread underscore exit because as soon as we call that, that function or that thread that called it is done. This uh, is not going to return anything here. And so notice the return value, it's a uh, void because we can't return anything from there. It gets returned through this value, not from this function. In other words, once we call this, like just like inside a function that you call return, once you call that, you're done inside that function. That's what this pthread underscore exit does as well. Okay, so here's a quick example uh, that I want to, uh, to show you. And you'll notice what I did in this case is I'm creating two of these uh, thread function uh, functions here. And I'm just calling them something generic, thread function. But here, pthread underscore t, t1, pthread underscore, these are to hold the IDs, the thread handles or thread uh, ID values. There's an integer pointer for arguments, character pointer for return value. And then down here, I start the threads. I pass the address of T1 and T2, these two uh, things in there. I pass null, so it uses the default attributes. Thread func 1, thread func 2, or a name of a function when used by itself, evaluates as the address of that function. And then here, I'm just passing null, meaning those functions do not expect any arguments up here. Now, that continues on the next page. And here I started them. Notice I don't have to do a uh, pthread underscore starter. As soon as I call create, it now it creates and starts those threads. Now, I then do a join for each of these. I free whatever the return value is for each of those. We need to remember to do that to not get memory leaks. And then at the end, I just say both threads finish. So what I'm doing inside of here each of these threads is relatively simple. In this thread, I'm going through 100 times, and I'm just doing a printf of one, and I'm flushing standard out after each one. And then at the end of that, I just do a pre-thread exit of null. I could leave that off, and it would uh, have an implicit return value anyway, which in this case is void. Here I'm just doing pthread exit after I do 100 of those. And the other thread two, I'm printing two, flushing it every time, and then pthread exit null. And then here is some, if I compile that and run that, here's some example output. And I would encourage you to compile that and execute it and take a look at it. But here's the output. I start the threads, and then I get this mixture of ones and twos. And notice it's unpredictable which one will come first and second. And notice that I don't have any delays in this code. This is just as fast as it can printfing these things. So you'll notice that 
the that kind of granularity of running these and see that we have these two different threads running very uh, quickly through that. You notice that two in this case tends to be the one that finishes a block of those, and that's probably because one started first. But if you run this on different occasions, you might finish with a one. You might start with a two. But you'll notice that since both of the threads are executing concurrently, you're going to get a different output from this uh, different times when you run it. And since we're not doing any synchronization, it's non-deterministic. We cannot predict what our output is going to be when we run this. Completely non-deterministic. Even from the very start, this one did 1-1. One, one. This one did 1-2. One, this one uh, ended with a bunch of twos here going all the back to there. This one did as well. So that was the same. But you'll notice here, 1-1. One, one, there was 2-1. It's going to be different every time we run this. Well, not every time, but that's going to be a lot of different ways we could interleave a uh, hundred and a hundred things to get different outputs. And we had that formula way back in class three or whatever. You can calculate how many different possible orderings there are. Okay, uh, with P threads, there you can do synchronization. Uh, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to pause for just a second, uh, and uh, I'll be back shortly but we're going to talk about the synchronization next. And it turns out that all the same synchronization options that are available to us in Python have uh, similar things in pthreads that are available. So we'll take a look at that here in just a second. Okay, now, in pthreads, there are synchronization mechanisms uh, that will be familiar to you, except the names are a little bit different. But pthreads offers three different uh, mechanisms for synchronization. There's join, uh, which we saw earlier, which is basically uh, you can start a thread and then when you hit the join, you can, that'll wait for that thread to complete. And we already uh, used that in the previous example with our main program running, waiting for the threads that spawn to join before terminating. And then there are mutexes, which a mutex is essentially uh, an equivalent to a lock. It can be locked, it can be unlocked, and that can control access to some uh, shared critical section. And it can operate to enforce mutual exclusion. And then there are also condition variables. Uh, and those condition variables work like condition variable objects did in Python, where they support weight, signal, and then broadcast, which broadcast is like a, a weight all, or a, I mean a signal all. But they're, those are analogous to the synchronization mechanism we, we, mechanisms we had seen previously. Now, mutexes are identical, like I said, to lock objects we've been using in Python. In other words, uh, we create this pthread mutex underscore t, that's the type of a mutex. Um, and then to create one, uh, we basically just declare that variable. And then I have a chip in my hand and the cat is eating it. Uh, and then we do, um, to use it, we basically just pass the address of that mutex variable to pthread mutex lock. That locks it. And then to unlock it, we say pthread mutex unlock. We pass the address of it to it to be unlocked. And you can have as many of those mutex variables as you want. Here I call this one mutex1. You don't have to call that. It could be called anything. Um, but that's essentially uh, the way that you uh, lock and unlock the mutex. And I'm, I've got a cat here. I don't know if you can see that or not, but. And so if you need more than one lock, you create as many of those variables as you want, and you lock them individually and unlock them like that with a critical section between them. Now, the condition variables um, allow threads to essentially suspend themselves or suspend execution. Uh, in other words, relinquish control until some condition is true. And that condition variable uh, has to be associated with um, some sort of mutex to avoid a race condition where one thread is preparing to wait and another thread uh, which has, may signal that condition before the other one actually waits. So that if that results, then we would have deadlock. And so we need to have a condition 
uh, along with a mutex in order to avoid that. So here's an example of that. So we would have some thread function here. Here's our while loop where we're, we have some a condition that we want to wait upon. Here's my uh, p thread condition wait. There's a, a, our condition object there. And here's this uh, mutex lock that's associated with that. We have p notice that the p thread function uh, condition variable wait has, we have to pass the address of both the lock and the, uh, the condition object or condition object identifier to that. We have to pass the addresses of both of those to it. And then here we're going to perform the condition protected action. And then after that, we are going to unlock. So we have to lock. We then have our wait for the condition here. And the reason we pass the address of that mutex in there is because while it's waiting, it releases that lock. So we need to pass the lock in there and say, okay, well, this condition that I was waiting for, the buffer to become available, whatever it is, uh, we need to unlock while we're waiting. So it needs access to the lock in order to do that, which is why we pass that to it. As soon as the lock, that con a condition happens or a notify happens, then it will unlock automatically and unblock here and we can go back and check our condition again. If now if it's uh, available, now we have the lock because we acquired it here and this returned it to us before it got to there. And since we're not no longer waiting, we can now come down here and have our critical section uh, between this while loop and the mutex unlock. Now, on the signal side of things, we just call pthread underscore uh, cond underscore signal, which is a condition variable signal, and we pass the uh, condition uh, that we want to signal to that. Notice we could also use broadcast, which is like signal all uh, that we saw in Python. So you could use condition signal or condition broadcast. This one signals just one of the waiting threads. Uh, this one broadcasts in, uh, all of them to give them all a chance. Now, let's take a few minutes here and look at the new way of dealing with concurrency. Starting with C++ 11. And that is that, um, remember that they decided that concurrency was so important that in C++ 11, they added um, something to the standard uh, language facilities to support it. And so that means we don't necessarily have to use a library like pthreads, we don't have to link to some library like we do with pthreads. Uh, so let's take a quick look at that uh, as an alternative to pthreads. Now, notice that in C++ 11, 14, 17, uh, and 20, you'll notice the things that were added in C++ 11, and this is kind of a, a chart of kind of the progression of the language standard. Notice that threads, mutexes, and locks, uh, thread local data, condition variables and tasks. Those were all things that were added. And then reader writer locks were added in 14. Uh, this parallel uh, implementation of the standard template library uh, was added in 17 to make certain parts of that faster. And then some other things, coroutines were added in C++ 20, uh, transactional memory task blocks, latches and barriers, and the standard future extensions, which are kind of a um, asynchronous thing and also atomic smart pointer. So the idea is that notice that C, the C++ standard has been adding concurrency features uh, since C++ 11. But we're going to focus on uh, this right here for right now, the uh, 2011 version of that. All right, so first off, here's some simple threading in C++ 11. Notice we don't have to include pthreads, we just pom include thread. And then I create my two functions. And this, this is a, a, a program that's equivalent to the one we did with pthreads. So I do thread uh, as the type, and I give it a name. And then to the constructor, I pass the function that I want. You could also optionally pass arguments to that function, but here we're just passing the function pointer. Very similar to pthread underscore create. And then here I just do t1.join. And since these are objects now, I've noticed that there's a thread object uh, instance for thread one and thread two. I just do a join on both of those. And then both threads 
the only time I'll get down here is when both threads are done. You could have done printf here if you wanted to. I'm using the C++ way with C out uh, for that. And do that. Now, what do the threads themselves look like? Well, they look like exactly what you'd expect. A function in this case, it just prints the stuff the same way we did before. Notice I don't need pthread underscore exit. That's all handled automatically. So notice this code is a complete version using just the thread um, object, the thread class that's built into C++. So I don't have to worry about uh, linking to a pthread library or including anything else. I just include thread, and then I can create a thread object instance, pass to it the function pointer that I want started, wait for them to complete, and then write my functions that I want to be my thread functions. Now, how do you do synchronization in C++11? Well, the C++ has mutexes that are part of the, um, the uh, included features, and you can just do standard colon colon mutex, that's the type, you give it a name, and then you can do mutex.lock, mutex.unlock. So whatever the name of the variable you gave it, just do dot .lock and dot .unlock. And notice that this mutex is an object, so we use the dot .lock method to lock it, the dot .unlock to unlock it, and then we put our critical section in there. And again, you, just like with pthreads, you could have as many uh, of those mutex objects as you want. And you can have as many threads share those mutexes uh, as you need. Notice, very analogous to pthreads, but an object-oriented approach rather than a um, procedural or imperative approach. Now, C++11 also supports other synchronization primitives. Um, there's mutexes, um, timed mutexes, which a timed mutex is kind of a, a mutex with a, a timeout period allowed. So you can wait for a certain amount of time and then unblock un when the timeout expires uh, or when you get access to the object. There's also a recursive mutex here, which is like an R lock uh, in Python, recursive mutex. Uh, there's also a recursive time mutex. Notice you can do all of these same things in Python with just the lock and R lock objects by passing in the optional timeout, but here it's separate um, objects. Also, there's this lock guard, which is, which is kind of like a scope-based uh, mutex ownership wrapper. There's this unique lock, which implements a movable mutex ownership wrapper. Uh, and I'll let you kind of look at these uh, later on. There's also condition variable and condition variable any. Um, and the difference between those is the condition variable has to be associated with a unique lock, like we see up here. Condition variable any will allow you to associate with any kind of lock object. And then there are some other concurrency features in C++11 and beyond uh, that are worth looking into. Uh, there's futures and async. Uh, latches and barriers, semaphores. Uh, there are also parallel algorithms that are built into the uh, standard template library that if you want to make something fast or take, uh, take advantage of the uh, multiple cores on your system to, for doing standard template library things, uh, you probably want to look into those. And what I would suggest you do is, uh, and really we've talked about like things like semaphores and barriers and futures and async in Python. It really works the same way in C++11. It's just a, uh, a C++ object uh, or class with object instances created from those. And so rather than go into the details of all those and examples of all of that, since we've covered the, the basic concepts of those in Python, uh, I'll just refer you to the reference here. There's this uh, cppreference.com website where if you go to this section in the documentation, uh, there's more, in, in, or more information there. And that's this for the C++ interface to that, but there are also C interfaces to that threading support that have been added in C11. So if you want to do something that's not object-oriented, it's just pure C language, procedurally done, then you can look at the documentation here. So you don't have to use those as objects. You could use them as function calls. And then it becomes very similar to how pthreads works, but built into the language C11. So I would encourage you to look at uh, both of these. 
look at some of the stuff that's available. Look at if you ever need to do something in C uh, and want to make that concurrent, which again, one of the primary motivator, motivators for doing something in C or C++ is speed. And one of the advantages of doing concurrent solutions to things is to improve performance. So it's pretty common that you might be writing some sort of algorithm in C and C++. And, hold on. All right, that's my stupid alert. Um, but what I would suggest doing is if you need something that performs uh, at a very high level, look at using concurrency to help you with that and look at using something like C or C++ because those are going to be some of your fastest choices you have for doing something like that. Um, there are some other things as well that you should probably look at. Uh, MPI has C libraries uh, for more uh, massively parallel um, things. There's also um, uh, PVM, which is a parallel virtual machine that you can feed tasks to and so forth. There's, there's a lot of different options that are available uh, for doing things like that. But that's all we're going to talk about today. I would encourage you to uh, look at this documentation back here for both that and that. And um, I tried to keep the lecture fairly short today. We're around, what, a half hour or so. So what we will do next class is we'll continue and look at some other um, concurrency implementations in other languages so you've been exposed to it. Uh, and then next week what we're going to do is kind of have just some lab day, lab time, uh, and I will post the study guide uh, next week as well. But we just have a couple little lectures left uh, to kind of clean up a few things, get you some exposure to some stuff that might matter for your career. And then uh, we'll go through the study guide, and then we'll have the final exam during final exam week. And I apologize for eating. I don't have time for a lunch break, so... Okay, so that's it. Everybody stay safe. Uh, and as always, if you're struggling with any of the assignments or have any questions on anything, uh, let me know. Shoot me a text message. Send me an email. I'm here to help. All right, that's it.